Good evening and welcome to the Institute for Human Sciences. My name is Ivan Vevoda, I'm a permanent fellow here, and uh, Hannes Svoboda on behalf of the International Institute for Peace and myself on behalf of the Institute for Human Sciences. We'd like to welcome you. Uh, this is a, an event co-organized by the Amsterdam Center for European Studies. We had an event today at the venue of the Institute here in Vienna on geopolitics and this evening is the grand finale, the, the panel that will be uh, hosted and moderated by Luisa Bialasiewicz, uh, professor. Um, we're very happy that this is the case and I'd just like to do a small plug-in for tomorrow. We have an excellent debate with uh, the European Council on Foreign Relations on European elections at 10 o'clock. Having said that, uh, Hannes, dear Hannes, please. Okay, thank you very much. I also welcome from my side as president of the International Institute for Peace. Geopolitics uh, is of course uh, a moving uh, science, on, on things are very moving. Nowadays even fake oligarchs can make politics. Uh, so it's, uh, you see how, how uh, different and complicated situations are and maybe geopolitics can bring one interpretation of what ha is happening in this world, but it surely is not the only one, but it may be that it gives a contribution of understanding the complexities of our world. Welcome and have a nice discussion, and please don't forget about European elections, to vote also, not only to discuss it, but also to vote. Thank you. And just before I give the floor to Lisa, for those of you who uh, want to attend tomorrow morning at 10, maybe you can sleep over here tonight in the <laughs> library. <laughs>
Halford Mackinder's book, Democratic Ideals and Reality. Uh, and though Mackinder doesn't use the word geopolitics, he subsequently was um, named as the father of geopolitics and that book and an earlier article that he wrote in 1904 are seen as the uh, sort of beginnings of the, defi of the defining of geopolitics as a, a particular field of study. Um, my particular approach uh, has definitely been uh, one that has been very critical of the type of uh, vision of grand strategy, which is imperial grand strategy that Mackinder uh, helped uh, establish. But there are, you can read Mackinder in a way which allows you to think uh, conceptually about geopolitics. And in, in particular, there are three ways, a sort of triangle that you can think about. The first of all is theorizing the geopolitical field. In other words, the particular uh, actors, uh, the gra great powers, and the lesser powers. Uh, uh, in a spatial field, dealing with land, dealing with climate, dealing with, with trade and, and ties, dealing with the natural environment. The second is a uh, kind of spatial mentalities. Uh, the particular, what I would call geopolitical culture of different states, the way in which states conceptualize their particular place in the world, their orientation, their, uh, the countries that they see as enemies, the countries that they see as, as friends, as models. And, and then the third is very much uh, on a technology. Um, Mackinder talks about spatial revolutions, and it's a term which is given greater prominence in the work of Carl Schmitt uh, later on. Spatial revolutions having to de do with uh, changes in technology and changes in, in infrastructure. Uh, we can think about the, the current moment in terms of these particular categories. And what I would like to, to speak about, and I can't talk about it in depth here, is in, in the geopolitical field that we begin to talk about the unusual phenomenon of what could be described as a destabilizing hegemonic power or a rogue superpower. And that is the way in which the United States has come to be uh, led by a figure for the second time within the last 10, uh, within the last decade or so, that is sort of breaking with international norms and uh, is pursuing a policy which is in some ways in a revolt against the uh, particular order that the United States helped create. Uh, now, under the Bush administration, we know with torture, uh, we know with uh, Guantanamo Bay, we know with the invasion of Iraq, that the United States lost a lot of legitimacy, which was restored under uh, Barack Obama. But then, with the Trump administration, we're seeing an intensification of the uh, reaction against the liberal international order that was, uh, it, it, which you know, Europe and the United States have forged and have taken forward. Uh, in particular, Trump's um, obsessive attempt to overturn uh, the so-called bad deals uh, of the Obama administration, the Iraq uh, uh, um, J JCPOA, Jigpoa is how some uh, people uh, describe it, um, then also uh, with NAFTA, uh, and then the current trade war with, with China. So that's one particular feature of the geopolitical field. Now let's talk about geopolitical culture. Uh, and again, w w I will focus on the United States. One of the things that uh, is distinctive about the current moment, it's not new, we've had it in the past, but is the way in which a conspiracy, conspiracism has taken over geopolitical culture and has crowded out our ability to think analytically and strategically about certain problems. There's a, a book which has just been published in the United States uh, which is called, um, uh, let me see, Most People Are Saying, and it's about the new conspiracism. And essentially, it makes the argument that previously we had conspiracy theories, and of course, the, uh, we had these, these were quite central to how 
uh, cultures and leaders and populations conceptualized what was happening in international affairs. So the hand of the KGB or the hand of the CIA operating in certain events. So there was a reading of those within a, a certain conspiratorial narrative. But it was usually a theory uh, which joined up the dots. And of course it often was quite um, classically conspiratorial in that there was a small elite that was dominating. Now this new book makes the argument that we have a conspiracism today without the theory. We have essentially assertions, fake news, uh, no collusion, uh, and particular um, and a, a sort of I um, theorizing by innuendo and by repetition and the ways in which this is kind of fueled by social media. So we're in a new era of conspiracism, and I think that's something we need to think about very carefully. Now, this is not something that's a feature of the United States. We have uh, in Vladimir Putin, a former uh, KGB officer who brings to geopolitics a particular disposition to see conspiracies, and then later it, in being president, a capacity to realize conspiracies. The argument against a new conspiracism is a not an argument that there are no conspiracies, but it's an argument that we need to distinguish carefully between conspiracies and conspiracism and not fall into conspiracism. And I think too often on both the right and the left, there's a falling into conspiracism. So that's the geopolitical culture. The last uh, issue is the geopolitical condition. And here, there's a lot that can be said about it. Uh, I would point people, if they're interested, to look at the book by Benjamin Bratton called The Stack, which uh, deals with the emergence of what he calls an accidental megastructure, which has to do with information technology, cloud computing, the fact that the vast majority of you have a little device in your pockets, which uh, is connected to um, infrastructures uh, and uh, data points which creates all sorts of surveillance uh, capacities, uh, all sorts of vulnerabilities and the like. Um, one of the things that uh, some political scientists in the United States have began to think about is the ways in which the globalization of the 1990s onwards the development of global supply chains, the development of um, infra, uh, smart cities, informational uh, information systems, uh, the internet and the, the, the central position of US technological firms in this, um, how that has created a, a particular geography in which uh, the, this, the kind of hard infrastructure uh, is located in certain places. It's often in the United States. And that gives the United States great capacity to, uh, in effect, instrumentalize a lot of this uh, kind of infrastructure, mega infrastructure. Uh, um, and so we saw how this is in part now leading to ruptures in the international arena. Uh, uh, Snowden re revelations revealing how the US government has been using uh, um, uh, various technological capacities in order to, to, to spy. And then, of course, the way in which uh, other governments, the, the Russians, have been able to use social media to advance a particular informational uh, agenda. Uh, they use the term weaponized interdependence, where you have a capacity, an ineluctable interdependence, uh, where we're all dependent upon these technological infrastructures, but they're tremendously vulnerable, and they are inevitably embedded within states, and states are using that embeddedness in order to advance particular uh, agendas. One consequence of this is now you're having a decoupling uh, of the, what was previously planetary infrastructure. In the case of uh, Huawei, uh, the Chinese uh, a technological firm and 5G is a really good example of how you are having weaponized interdependence play itself out. I've probably spoke for too long, uh, but that's at least uh, some things for us to, to chat about. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
So our next speaker, Gwendolyn Sasse, is the director of SOAS, um, Research Institute for Central and Eastern European Studies in Berlin, but you also are a professor of political science at Oxford. And um, so you're going to take a kind of um, a different, um, a, well, not necessarily approach, but to look at some of the other scales where geopolitics is made and certainly where geopolitical orientations are made and understood. So. I will leave the floor to you. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this discussion. Um, I mean, first of all, let me maybe um, share a few thoughts of mine on geopolitics, and then I really indeed want to come a bit from, from below or from the side to um, address what, what people in, in particular in a, in a war zone, in the Donbass, think of um, geopolitics or aspects that affect geopolitics. Um, and I have time also a little bit about the younger generation in Russia, which could be another test case of some of the assumptions we carry with us when we talk about geopolitics. But uh, first of all, the question I find, found intriguing, and therefore I was very, very pleased to be asked to, to be on this panel. So the return of, of geopolitics. So, of course, then the, immediately the question is, had it ever gone away? Um, or did we just not see it? Um, or um, are we kind of thinking about international politics um, differently now again, and I think it is the latter, uh, compared to the immediate um, post-Cold War period. Um, and I have to say right away, as a German national and as a political scientist, I don't use the word geopolitics very often. Um, and I'm also not entirely convinced um, of the analytical value of it. And we already do in the workshop today, a few people mentioned this as well. So I think you've, you've heard just now a, a very sophisticated, I think, distinction of different fields and layers uh, one can look at. Um, if one continues along that line, for me at some point there might be actually the point to, to ask, um, is this still geopolitics we're looking at? And have we come actually quite far from how it was originally um, conceived and do we need that term? But maybe that's something for the discussion. But I can't help noticing and therefore it is clearly an important um, signal the term sends out that it is used a lot more now than it even was a few years ago. And I spent the last week in Brussels and uh, at some of the celebrations of the Eastern Partnership. It was more a celebration and a birthday party than a really a critical reflection. But uh, I thought it was interesting that the high representative, uh, Federica Mogherini, um, uh, stood up and said, and now in five, the last five years, so the five years that she had been in office, uh, we have proven that the Eastern Partnership is not about geopolitics and geopolitical choices. She then had to leave um, and uh, the Lithuanian foreign minister on the next panel um, stood up and said um, he wanted to vehemently disagree. Eastern Partnership is all about geopolitical choices. Uh, there then wasn't enough time to discuss this, but I thought both were quite interesting, that this very this emphasis on that it is this choice or that, that somebody could say it has nothing to do with geopolitics and that we have now shown, which um, the evidence wasn't, wasn't really forthcoming at that point. So I think the fact um, that the term is used more and how it's used is, is really signaling something interesting. Um, it also, I think, in kind of reflects perhaps a number of different things. And that, again, suggests that the term itself remains quite imprecise. So I, I think it really, as a signal, it, it, it shows a number of things like we're not sure, in particular from where we're sitting here or in, in Europe or Western Europe in particular, um, what um, global politics around us really looks like and things we have taken for granted, um, like the, the liberal um, uh, rules-based order doesn't seem to, to work the way we perhaps hoped in the immediate post-Cold War period. The transatlantic relationship is under um, a great strain. Um, we're not sure, I think, how um, foreign policy, international politics and, and democracy or, or liberal values can be combined. So is it about more interest-based policies and or more value-based policies and can the two be uh, pursued at the same time? So this is something that I'm currently based in Berlin um, that also um, at the heart of German government, they're thinking about what does that mean now, Europe's role and then also Germany's role within that Europe. So I think it, it suggests primarily um, a number of uncertainties, and they are partly, I think, captured in this, this uh, term, uh, geopolitics. Um, also, today during the day, an, a number of speakers um, suggested, and, 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 and I would agree, that um, Ukraine plays a pivotal role in this, this shift towards thinking more 
uh, beyond perhaps academic circles, more in these geopolitical terms. If we think back, 2014 was the year Russia annexed Crimea. Um, it followed um, in the aftermath of the Euromaidan, the, the mass protests in Ukraine, and they were triggered, they were not caused by, but they were triggered by uh, the then president Yanukovych not signing the association agreement with the EU. So this sounds like a geopolitical cause. If you look closely or if you remember what happened at the time, it was the trigger and it expressed much more widespread disappointment about corruption in the regime. And we seem to have come full circle as the, as the last elections have shown us. Um, so the, but then Russia's action in Crimea going clearly against international law um, uh, were one consequence and the war in the Donbass, um, a different kind of, of warfare and uh, um, uh, a breach of international law in terms of uh, recognising state borders. That war, war is still going on and that set uh, the scene uh, for the sanctions regime in place by both the EU and the US vis-a-vis -vis Russia. And I think what happens as, as time goes on um, uh, politics are loca located at this international level and for many reasons rightly so and we hear a lot about um, east-west tensions and of course the west isn't really the west anymore so maybe it's the EU, parts of the EU and, and the US or parts of the US vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia and then there are various other players so it has become much more complicated also than in the Cold War era so that's why the term new Cold War would be even more pro problematic than, than I think geopolitics. Um, so but while that is happening, um, the, uh, the actual developments on the ground in, for example, a war in Europe um, tend to be, I think, forgotten. I don't follow the Austrian media on a daily basis, but in um, the UK where I lived for a long time and now in Germany, the war in Ukraine doesn't really figure very prominently in the media. So a little more maybe around the election, but now that's over, let's see what happens next. Um, and uh, just today I read, I think a couple of days ago or yesterday, the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the German Parliament in the Bundestag um, said something about in, in Europe we, we don't go to war anymore, we settle conflicts differently. And uh, that's surprising because the same person usually actually is quite outspoken on, on Ukraine and Russia. But that suggests something about the perception um, that uh, Ukraine is not Europe. But that also means forgetting the, 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 the starting point of some of the, the renewed, I think, discussion about geopolitics and, and, and what that means. Um, at uh, SOIS, the Center for East European and International Studies, which um, I, I have the honor of, of trying to, to establish. It's only been in existence for two and a half years. We have conducted a number of surveys and uh, these are surveys um, in difficult settings um, that are also a risk and uh, coming from a university setting I now realize I appreciate the, the opportunity to be able to conduct these because it, the, the idea behind them is to get as close as possible to the views of those affected most by geopolitics in some way, by war uh, more concretely. And those are both the displaced but also the resident population in both parts of the Donbass, not the government controlled part and the non-government controlled part. Um, and you can say these are not surveys conducted in ideal conditions, they clearly are not, but I would argue for taking the voice of those who are directly affected by wars like that seriously. And if you do that, if you look closely and also compare what people say on the ground um, and compare that also with, for example, public opinion data for the whole of Ukraine, you come up with a number of things which I think go somewhere, some way towards saying that geopolitics from below um, looks different um, and make, may make you give you also more or does give you a more nuanced perspective. Um, compared to maybe the also important, but not necessarily very nuanced, official discourse at the level of international politics. And I think we have seen in Ukraine, today is the day when the new president Zelensky um, has been sworn in. Um, that election victory was portrayed widely as a, as a surprise. But if you look closely at what actually the population across Ukraine, but also in particular in, in the war zone thought beforehand, it doesn't come as a surprise. Um, and it is, it, the survey evidence, for example, shows that within um, the, the last two years, or in fact, in particular from 2017 to 2018, um, an important identity shift took place in Ukraine. And this is across the country. 
um, with some regional variation, but the trend holds throughout. And that is a strengthening of the notion of Ukrainian citizenship, an inclusive notion tied to the state, which is not a narrow ethnic, regional, um, language-based or foreign policy-based in terms of orientations and definition of who belongs to the Ukrainian state. And that is something that I think is reflected in these um, elections. Another thing that um, does not, I think, square nicely with um, perhaps our views in the absence of information about what people in the war zone actually think, uh, in the non-government controlled um, parts, so in the self-declared self, um, uh, self-declared republics, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, um, a majority in 2017, and then we've repeated it now, 2019, um, told us that they still want to be part of the Ukrainian state. Um, so I don't think this is, this is either the answer you would have expected if you consider that um, uh, these are not ideal survey conditions. We had to do a telephone survey, obviously not from Berlin, but from various parts in Ukraine and also from Russia. Um, so this is not an ideal um, condition. So you could expect people being afraid, saying the op opposite or saying something that seems more obviously in line with what they expect the person asking the question um, to say. But the majority still says they want to be part of Ukraine. I don't think that is how Kiev sees it very often. Maybe it's changing now, we don't know yet. And I don't think that is how we think about it internationally. So I think that's an, again an important corrective to think about how people see things on the ground. Um, not surprisingly perhaps people directly affected by the war, not so much the displaced, they seem to as they are being displaced um, and experience a lot of difficult things, they seem to nevertheless preserve a more positive image of, for example, the EU, whereas those living in the Donbass clearly don't have that. So there you also get some of the more skeptical views on, on not, ne not necessarily the Western orientation of the country, but international institutions that they think have not delivered. Incidentally, the most positive views are held about the UN, which is the institution that hasn't got involved yet in, in, the, in the Donbass. So that's probably a trend, but also perhaps an opening of how to think about who could, um, I think I'm getting nodded at, I need to, need to conclude and I will conclude. So um, I think going closer to people affected by um, geopolitics and their views on this need to be taken more seriously. And I end just with one uh, finding from a, a completely different part of a bit of research on youth in Russia. Youth in Russia plays a very ambivalent role. They are both um, organized in, in um, state-controlled or, or quasi-controlled um, youth organizations, which um, to some extent um, resemble military training organizations, but they're also in the front row of protests. So this ambivalence, I think, is something that uh, we would also need to take um, into account, sort of thinking what does the younger generation think of, of some of these um, sort of geopolitical choices they, they, um, they, they might face. Um, we asked um, 2,000 um, younger people across Russia in cities, I have to, have to um, emphasize, 15 cities, regional cities, um, and the order in which they, they gave the countries that they want to have, that they want Russia to have the closest relations with, were China with nearly 30%, the US with nearly 20%, admittedly all of the EU together is also about 20%, but of EU countries, Germany is the, f the first one with about 7%. Um, but if we then go further and ask who, who has, holds these views, um, it, it is very closely linked to the number, the amount of transnational experiences people have. And this actually transcends uh, views on, say, for example, democracy or regime type. So whoever has already got migration links or family links, remittances being sent back home or having traveled somewhere, seems to override ideological choices about um, where um, the closest relations should lie. And I end here with sort of this um, a slight skepticism about the word geopolitics, but taking it as a very important si signal and wanting to know more about um, ordinary people, as we scholars sometimes call it. Sounds very um, condescending, but it means normal people, not elites. Thank you very much for that. Um, Ivan, the floor is yours. You need no introduction. Ivan Krastev is a permanent fellow here at the UVM and also chairman of the Center for Liberal Strategies in Sofia, among many other roles. So I will give you the floor. Two brilliant speakers telling you why they feel uneasy about geopolitics, using and talking about geopolitics as a term. I'm going to try to 
make my presentation why European policymakers share the sentiment. Uh, and I'll start with three facts that look totally unrelated, but they're going to help me to make a point. In, uh, uh, after the end of the Cold War, uh, former American National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezewski was telling that when he visited former Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko, once Gromyko took him and said, let's show you something. And he, they went to a small room which was next to his cabinet. And in this room there was just two objects. There was a big map of the world and there was a chair. Uh, and Brzezinski said, uh, Grumiko told Brzezinski, when I have opportunity, when I have time, I can spend hour just sitting here and looking at the map. And Brzezinski was extremely positive about this because he said this is what was the strength about the Soviet Union. They have a strategic view. Uh, and then basically the second fact that I want to give you is that the answer of the question that best predicts who is going to be elected the President of the United States of all the questions that you're asking on the poll is the question who of the candidates best is going to protect the United States from the invasion of an aliens. Uh, for the moment, this was done for the period of now 16 years, any time basically the candidate who get better result on this question was elected the President of the United States. And the third uh, fact which is going to help me to make a very short point after this is that uh, in this uh, study that uh, you're going to come after sleeping uh, in this room tonight to be presented tomorrow at 10, uh, European Council of Foreign Relations asked in 15 EU member states just two months ago which is the biggest threat that the European Union is facing today. And here's the surprising results. In every single of these 15 European Union member states, Radical Islam came as a security threat number one to the extent that in Poland, which is not famous with many Muslims there, uh, basically it came higher than Russia, which traditionally basically was viewed there. Why I'm saying this? I'm saying this because one of the interesting story about the European Union is that when we talk about the return of the geopolitics, I do believe in a much more kind of a common sense definition is that this day when we see power, we see state. The more basically you have this kind of the imagination of the public but the policy makers, if 10 or 15 years ago the major shift was basically talking about the non-state actors, talking about the terrorism, talking about different type of threats which were not connected to a state actor, now you have a much stronger kind of a shift uh, to understanding everything that is happening in the world as a competition between big powers, rivalry powers and others, which is the best expressed in uh, the, the last uh, national security doctrine of the United States, where basically it's very much focused on the rival powers, on the United States, on Russia, on others, very different than basically focus on terrorism uh, from uh, uh, from before. Uh, why I'm saying this? Because in a strange way, uh, this is happening nevertheless that at the same time we understand how important some of the non-state actors are. We are talking about the big multinational companies, you're talking about Google, you're talking Facebook, you're talking Alibaba. But I do believe that the interesting stor story about geopolitics is that outside of their own countries, these big companies more than ever before starts to have a national passports. When basically Russians talk about Apple or Google, they mean the United States and they mean the United States government. And in the case uh, basically of the Chinese company, and you can see the latest decision of the United States and others, any big Chinese company simply means Chinese state. This is an interesting development and this interesting development is particularly problematic for the European Union and I'm going to tell you why basically the problem comes with the EU. Uh, I have uh, the opportunity to stay with a group of uh, people that have been kind of working uh, together with, uh, uh, with the Brussels bureaucracy on the last global security strategy. And if you compare the previous one in 2003 with what we have now, you're going to see how much the world has changed for the European Union. 2003, the global security strategy started with the world. Never before Europe was safer, freer and more united. In the last security doctrine that we came, it's called global security strategy, not security doctrine. The key word is resilience. Why it's so problematic for the European Union 
to talk about geopolitics, uh, not because of the kind of conceptual ambiguity, but because of the political difficulties. First, because till recently, European Union was the only global power with unidentified borders. If you listen to the discourse of the European Union, we are always bordering future members. No, but this was true. Turkey was in accession. The Balkans have been in accession. Ukraine was in the accession. So from this point of view, part of the European project was based on a hard budgets and soft borders. In a certain all of your borders, and this was a major debate, only the French were insisting give us the final borders. But the European Union basically was a political actor in a global political scene, which was very much insisting that the borders are not so important because also because our borders have been expanding. Secondly, the huge problem for us was because of this, the nature of the borders was totally different. The idea of the soft borders was that for the European Union, it was extremely important to have the borders that are easy to cross for goods, but for many things. The refugee crisis, of course, very much put all this into question and the major security assumptions that was behind this European strategy was that economic interdependence is a major source of security. So basically, if you trade with certain countries, the more you're trading, the less the possibility it is for them to fight. Uh, and also very much that on the territory of Europe, not of the world military power, is losing its appeal. So the biggest problem for Ukraine from the European point of view was not simply that what was done was uh, uh, breaking international laws and people's lives were destroyed, but these two assumptions became highly problematic. The fact that you are trading with something very actively and that you are very much interdependent can be a source of security, but under certain conditions it could be a source of insecurity. And historians have showed that it is a source of security when both sides have a positive view of the future. But if the both sides start to have a negative view about their common future, the more interconnected you are, the more vulnerable you are. From this point of view, if, for example, compare the talk about the Cold War and the new Cold War with China, just to give you one figure to understand why this conversation is totally different. The trade between Soviet Union and the United States in the late 1980s was around $2 billion per year. The trade between the United States and China today is around $2 billion per day. So before you have a Cold War, which was very much based on a certain type of a political and other entities which are not interacting with each other. It was kind of a clashes between the worlds which basically have been very much close in each other. So now you have such a level of interdependency that the fact that you're exposed to others can give you security but also can totally give you insecurity. Other states can interfere in your economic policies, in your foreign policy, in uh, your domestic politics. And this creates this biggest problem with the idea of the geopolitics is that people start to try to see the state behind anything that is happening exactly to deal with the anxiety coming from this type of interdependency. It is much easier to believe that the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, I don't know whom is behind everything that is happening, than basically to ask the question, who is behind it? And I'm going to end up with uh, uh, an example very much based on uh, uh, the latest video that became hit here in Austria with what happened. <laughs> no, and I'm going, uh, uh, I'm going to do it in the way uh, not to, uh, to hurt anybody politically. But go at the logic of this video and you're going to be shocked by four major assumptions on which all this conversation is done. First, you have why it became possible. It became possible because basically people that have been part of the conversation believe that they are foreign nationals and Russian foreign nationals who could be interested to interfere and to give money for the politics in a small Austria. Secondly, uh, it was possible because you basically believe that the way the Russians are doing this is, is through family members probably beautiful girls in general. Uh, thirdly, this is done because you believe that you're doing this and everybody is doing this. But fourthly, it also shows how thin is the connections between the far right and the Russian Federation. Because if you basically believe that this girl is Russia, it means that your other Russian connections are not very strong. 
uh, because otherwise you're going to check the girl and basically you're going to have an official channel through which you're doing this. I'm saying this because from this point of view, and I very much want uh, to connect with the first uh, uh, talk about the conspiracy part of the geopolitical imagination. In a certain way, this conspiratorial symbolic politics started to have a world of its own. Uh, in a certain way, all the time, when you see something happening around the world, there are only two things that you believe. First, it's not accidental. Nothing is happening by accident. And secondly, most probably, there is a state behind it. There is a covert operation. And this is the paradox of this world in which at one and the same time we talk how much people have been empowered, we know each other, how much accidental things is happening in our life. But on the other side, when it comes to the big politics, never is accidental and this is always a state behind it. And I do believe this is the paradox of this geopolitics. The less geopolitics explain what is happening, the more eager we are to consume it. Thank you for that. And in a sense, I think you answered in many ways the two points raised previously, because I think this, um, this desire for, you know, kind of simple explanations of what are quite, you know, kind of messy and complex global events. You know, and, and geopolitical visions have always done that. They have provided kind of simple and simplified visions of the world. And so the question is, you know, why today we are once again drawn to them? And I, you know, I'm thinking of what you said as well, that, you know, kind of, um, yeah, the need to have a kind of an easy explanatory framework where you can also kind of stick in a state actor that can be somehow blamed. But I wanted the two of you to respond to Ivan's comments to see what you, um, what you make of both, um, you know, this is a, somehow an explanation for why geopolitics has come back and why it has become so useful. Um, sure, um, I think you put it very well and, and in terms of the, uh, this paradox that you began with um, to say that um, on the one hand uh, we hear a lot about states and the role of states but precisely at a time when states in the global setting can't really play that role anymore. So I think um, in particular I think where you, where, you, where you started there I thought that was very very well put. I also thought that and um, I think it partly explains why why uh, we hear so, more, so much more about geopolitics now. Um, the point you made about um, sort of interdependence, if you have too much interdependence in a way, you become more vulnerable. I mean, if we take that one step further, it means sort of the more interdependent you are, the more you, you really have to rely on uh, at least a basic level of trust and you have to agree on some rules of your interaction. I mean, they don't have to be uh, sort of nice liberal or Western democratic ideals and rules, but you have to have that in place. And that is not in place um, anymore, or at least it has never been in place with all the players that would have to have that in place. But maybe that is, that is sort of one, one step how we can then link it back again to kind of the, the discussions about the rules-based order. That, um, but, but, but I think I, I agree, and it was, it, was, it was well and provocatively put uh, basically too much interdependence makes you more vulnerable than, than, than protected. I also wanted to come back to, if I may, to, or, or are we doing another round? Am I allowed one, <laughs> one other point? Because if we think um, the idea of conspiracy forward, and maybe it doesn't quite um, reach um, the levels, um, let's say, um, it has reached in the US at the moment, um, but I think there is a similar pattern at work in, in Europe. So I think the tendency to um, uh, want to blame big geopolitical players, for example, um, Russia, for things which are ultimately homegrown domestic political problems and other players like um, Russia, like the Kremlin or associated actors um, uh, benefit from it, use that, um, these opportunities that uh, present themselves, I think is, a, is, is perhaps a, a somewhat milder version, but points to the same same problem, that it um, helps to, to offload um, domestic political issues, problems, and very quickly we see sort of Russian meddling in elections in, 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 in particular, for example. Um, and the, the other point I think you made, um, um, and, and they're interesting enough if we look at kind of uh, the global stage and look at the US and Russia at the moment, I'm wondering if they're going in different directions on that trend. You've given good examples with that um, discussion about conspiracy and how, how it, 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 it flies currently, in particular in the US. Um, foreign policy has become 
a salient electoral issue. So elections now, it matters in the US uh, to have the f at least a version of um, kind of uh, foreign policy priorities or standing in the world. That was not always the case. I don't think <coughs> elections were won on, on, um, on foreign policy, um, international politics um, types issues, type issues. Um, so that, and that is hard to imagine that that will go away, even if the president goes away at some point. So I think there's a sort of a certain shift going on if we look at Russia, I'm wondering if, if sort of the opposite trend is beginning to show, uh, without rushing to any conclusions, that as we can see in opinion polls, um, uh, the effect of um, uh, foreign policy um, actions on popularity of the current regime um, is, is in doubt. So at least um, the, the costs of um, um, interventions of wars um, is beginning to trickle down. This does not make mean a, a breakdown of the regime by no means, but the, the scope for turning um, foreign policy into domestic political benefit seems to be getting smaller, whereas I think in the US it has just um, radically increased. Um, so, uh, I'd make a point at the, at the outset about the term geopolitics and I see it as a sort of a super signifier that floats around and acts like a sponge to name things which often are quite disparate. And so in certain ways it is not a useful term and I think this sort of came up this uh, today. Um, it, uh, there are at least five different definitions uh, of uh, geopolitics, and I, I won't go into them. Uh, um, but um, the, it's still relatively well understood that it is great power politics or great power competition across the world political map with an emphasis on the great powers. And that never went away. And, you know, it is a shame if we think it did. Uh, because that is one of the features of international affairs. Um, the second thing I would say is that there is a conceit when the term, the signifier geopolitics is used often, that geopolitics is that which they do. It is something which the enemy does. It is something which is a problem for uh, those that are uh, adopting rules which are um, um, sort of in some ways uh, focus, overly focused on territory which are zero sum, uh, which are aggressive and so on and so forth. And what that move does is that it constitutes you as the virtuous figure or virtuous power that is interested in liberation, is interested in democracy, that is interested in freedom and the like. But, you know, I agree with the, uh, uh, the Lithuanian foreign minister. You know, it is about geopolitics. The European Union is about geopolitics. It's a particular vision of geopolitics and it would, uh, and you know, it is dangerous to assume that that is not going to create security dilemmas. And I think that's one of the fundamental problems that we've seen uh, with the Ukraine crisis is that the European Union and NATO expanding uh, or, you know, enlarging, if you want to be, to use the more uh, soft version of it, um, was not seen as geopolitical. It was seen as the, uh, as somehow a, a much more virtuous and high-minded and the like. Uh, my colleague, uh, my colleagues uh, and I just came back from Georgia, um, and Georgia has in the, in the center of Tbilisi, there is an information center, and it's an EU and NATO information center. Um, and so the idea that there could be an EU which is separate from NATO is not part of the discussion there. And the Georgians quite legitimately and reasonably want to be part of NATO because they want the security guarantees that go along with that. The Ukrainian, certain elements within Ukraine want that too. They're very clear minded about that. Um, I think that um, certain uh, folks within the um, Republican Party in the U.S. 
are now more clear-minded. Uh, Wes Mitchell, who was the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and uh, Eurasia, uh, was, was one of these particular figures, and a sort of geopolitical vision. But the problem with that is that, that is a, ultimately it's an aggressive policy in which you're creating a security dilemma. You are uh, not allowing another state to, in this case Russia, to have security interests and particular concerns about the fact that a hostile alliance is on its borders. Um, we, and when I mean we, I'm saying the United States uh, would not accept that. Uh, the United States, uh, may, people may think that it's not concerned about Mexico. If Mexico was going to join a hostile alliance, as Cuba did during the Cold War. The United States would be extremely concerned about it. Territory still matters, T proximity still matters, um, um, and, and I think that that's a fundamental feature of the international uh, system. It's, it is the, the spatiality that this term geopolitics uh, touches upon. It's always with us. Yeah, I to it's, ask it's you. Important. By the way, Wes Mitchell is going to be here, I do believe, in 10 days to give a talk. So he's going to have the right of self-defense. Uh, but what is important is the classical idea of geopolitics also and kind of assumes a clear understanding of what is a sphere of influence. And I do believe that the f real challenge of the modern world is to define what a sphere of influence is. Normally, in a Cold War, sphere of influence can be very easily decided by the nature of the political regime, that basically trade partnership, and kind of a certain, of course, when we don't talk about military presence, alliances, and others. I do believe that one of the interesting stories is that if you see with whom countries are trading, these days it's not so easy to understand. What is more influential is this, or is this the soft power and basically kind of a cultural connections, uh, particularly for countries which are not part of the alliances. I agree totally with you. It's totally different when you have a military alliance. And one of my uh, major kind of guesses going to be probably in the future, what kind of a search engine you're using could turn to be much more important for the political identity of your state and society than the trade regime. Are you staying on Google? Are you using basically the Chinese search machine? Are you going with Yandex and others? So from this point of view, the very idea of sovereignty is not simply anymore about defense of your territory or political regime. If you see the new, uh, basically, Russian security doctrine, the digital sovereignty is becoming a major issue. The possibility that basically you should try to use the internet not as a kind of a global network but as a national network. And I find this kind of a very important story and very much to agree with something about the European Union. Uh, the European Union was very well benefiting of its military weakness. For a very long period of time everybody was looking at the European Union and said they really don't want to fight. They, they have military budgets, but most of this military budget is just social work. Uh, uh, they don't have a projection power. And then I do believe this was also something that happened to the Russians in Ukraine was, and they was always saying European Union is fine, NATO is not fine. And this was also the Balkans and others. But then suddenly, what you start to realize is that in a certain way you don't need to have a military presence in order to transform societies. And from this point of view, European Union was very much benefiting from the fact that it was not perceived as a military power, but now it is becoming a problem for the EU because first others have the military power and some of them are very much ready to use it. But secondly, European Union started to be accused strongly of being the most hypocritical power of all pretending that you're not interested in geopolitics, pretending that this is not this, this is not that, because you can say many things about President Trump. There is one thing in which he cannot be accused of being hypocritical. <laughs> He's very clearly saying where he stood, what is important for him, Trump first, America first, from this point of view. No, and I'm not, uh, there is an irony, but not only an irony. So in a world in which you basically defined immediately where you stand, uh, he said, I come here to make profit, 
the European discourse is we come here to make you happier and if we make profit it's not going to be very bad for us. Uh, 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 and this creates a problem. Everything that was a major kind of an advantage of the European Union in a previous period is starting to be perceived as a vulnerability and disadvantage. I was wondering if maybe you wanted to kind of jump in on that. I mean, you know, precisely thinking, you know, of how the EU continues to pretend that it's not a geopolitical power, even if we reconsider what geopolitics is, if we take it now to be something very different, and how, you know, that hypocrisy, because I think, you know, it is more than ambiguity, it is hypocrisy actually very much undermines its role. So I'm kind of thinking also of the research you have been doing. I mean, that, that really applies, I think, to uh, this whole policy, the Eastern Partnership. Um, if we think back, if we can think that far back, when it started as the European Neighbourhood Policy, it was actually very much about a security um, interest, and it was actually pretty clearly stated for once. So it wasn't so hypocritical at the time. It was about creating Prodi's famous phrase of creating a ring of friendly countries. No, that is that is a pretty pretty clear statement that it's ultimately about security. So we want to trade, but we also want to pe pe keep people out and in, in their places. So, but then something has changed. I think I, I would agree. It shifted in a. In a, in, a, in a pretty um, important way that makes it a more, more hypocritical actor. But also in terms of if we stay with the, 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 the six, admittedly very different Eastern Partnership countries, um, there's a, a certain trend towards making this now look more like a, not only like a technical process of sort of development assistance. So it's almost as if it's gone sort of full, full circle. And, and um, I was actually struck last week that, that some people um, inside the Commission um, working quite closely with some of the, the Eastern Partnership countries are not ruling out that that whole um, process also can be rolled back again. So assistance to these countries because of this narrow conception of that it is like a technical process or development assistance so that actually the security part has been taken out of it and that exactly I would agree with the Lithuanian foreign minister but also um, the, the, the various eastern partnership countries saying it's very much about security, different aspects of security and it's not all military security either. But I think that is one sort of example where, where somehow it started more explicitly with security um, concerns, um, but also has somehow, in the rhetoric at least, um, got lost. And, and I think, um, uh, I mean, an important point was also brought up about this, um, the example that you gave from Georgia about um, sort of the EU and NATO being run together. And in, in Ukraine, it was always the language which actually now, and, and not, all, not only since the, since the last elections now, has been scaled back, but this Euro-Atlantic integration, no? it's the same idea that there you have one office, so it's even in one place, the information office. I think, um, I don't think that was ever the case in Ukraine, that the information offices were the same, but the, the whole language of Euro-Atlantic integration meant exactly that, that, which you didn't have the two kind of occurred in the end in parallel, but in Central and Eastern Europe these were still seen as, by elites and the public, as separate processes and they got run together more and more. And now the EU and NATO both, I think, um, um, in the process of, of redefining their, their, their role, their space, also leaves um, uh, kind of, I think, some some uh, problematic messaging which becomes possible because of um, also um, hypocritical kind of messages being sent. But if we think about kind of the position of NATO, despite its, its rhetoric, I, I wouldn't say this is the strongest moment of, of, of NATO. Um, but at the same time, even those countries in Europe, among them um, uh, several um, uh, Nordic and Central East European countries, um, obviously, for obvious reasons, and rightly so, demand that security guarantee, but at the same time, um, their messaging to the EU about security um, that needs to be strengthened is quite different from what gets um, uh, kind of communicated uh, to, to Washington. So the main line in that sense is still Washington. So it's somehow the, and, and vice versa from the US, the same, same thing if you look at the president, but also at Congress. So it, there's different, different players and that undermines ultimately, and it becomes possible, it undermines um, thinking in a, in a coherent way and less hypocritical way about what security can mean and means for the EU, but also um, the actor kind of NATO and its relationship to the EU is, is, is work in progress, shall we say. Thank you very much for that. So also conscious of the time, um, I'm sure many of you have views on what is the geopolitics today. So what we will do is we'll gather maybe three questions for a start. So we've got one here, two, okay. 
Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm Hannes Sobel, the president of the IAP. I want to continue on this question on geopolitics and Eastern Partnership because I was also at the meeting. But to be very frank, Mogherini meant Eastern Partnership is not a strategy against Russia. And uh, the Lithuanian foreign minister, whom I know very well since many years, is saying, yes, it is a strategy against uh, Russia. And the Polish foreign minister said, it must be a strategy against Russia, but we have to take into account special situations in Belarus and in Armenia and so on. So how can you define a geopolitical strategy if inside the EU you have very different opinions about going for or against Russia, and with your partners you have different opinions. You can do what you did, what, what is happening in Georgia, uh, in Georgia, but you could not have opened a joint office in Belarus or in Armenia. So could you a bit, uh, deal with this issue, how to differentiate a strategy, a geopolitical strategy of the EU in, in view of Russia seeing that environment? Add one more question here. Um, so I'm Brian. Um, I study at Webster University. So my question would be for you: um, uh, Would the um, conflict in Ukraine um, be a case of points of interdependence having a positive correlation on the conflict? So that's it. And there is a question all the way in the back. Sorry to make you run with the microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mykola Balaban. I'm from Ukraine. Um, so my question is very short and simple. Uh, what happens with um, geopolitics of values or value-based geopolitics? Because now you're talking about like classical Bismarck realpolitik. Thank you. Who wants to jump in on any of those? Do you want to start? The last one, um, uh, I think often, and I think wrongly, interest-based policies and, and value-based policies get, get um, contrasted. Um, I think connecting it to the point I made before, that I think also in, in, in Europe we see this trend that uh, um, it's easier to blame outside influences um, for uh, weaknesses of our democratic systems than actually address the causes of that, I think that ties up with the need for a more explicit um, value-based um, foreign policy of um, individual member states and also the EU. That is not easy to do, but a core value should clearly be, I think, the rule of law. Um, and this also means uncomfortable things inside the EU. And uh, we see this vis-a-vis -vis Hungary, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Poland, and how the EU is finding it very difficult um, to, to address this. But personally, I think, even if it means that the EU will look different and maybe um, more countries will, will uh, not participate either in all of what the EU stands for or in parts of it, um, not forcing that issue of the values that are important to uh, European democracies inside the EU, um, I think there's no, no, no hope that there, there will be kind of a, um, a sensible European foreign policy. This is, however, contrasted with um, the interest in keeping everybody on board uh, for the sake of, of um, having um, a, a stronger voice in, in global politics. But in, in my view, that is a misconception. And actually starting with a key value like the rule of law um, uh, would, would actually strengthen, I think, however, perhaps in EU in a different, um, different format. Um, and on, you asked the question on how can there be a geopolitical or international differentiated strategy. Um, if anybody knew, I think that was probably quite obvious last, last week and has been obvious for a while because using kind of the 10th birthday of, of the Eastern Partnership to launch a reflection process where probably a birthday is a good occasion when you say how, where it's going, I think made that quite clear that it, it, is, um, it, is, our, it is a clear fact that um, these um, six states and then perhaps in, in groups of three and the other three not really as a group um, have different interests vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the EU and I think neither the EU nor the Eastern Partnership countries I think have a clear idea of how how you could build a policy on that so I think it's also probably a bit too easy to, to you weren't doing that but just to blame the EU that it doesn't really know how to now 
without kind of doing more of the same. And it is uh, a path that for the EU probably looks, and for many member states, looks uncomfortably close to the process that leads to accession, which there's no um, consensus on. But then what is different or how you actually perhaps address additional concerns from these countries is also um, not clear. But having said that, I think um, Armenia mm -hmm. is probably the most interesting case um, so far, and um, Belarus could become uh, another such interesting case that the EU has managed to um, define a type of relationship that is that is very different from the deep and free, um, from comprehensive free trade agreements with with Moldova, um, Ukraine, and Georgia. But there is an attempt to take into account that a country like Armenia will have to have uh, good relations in different different um, directions. That I think is is new for the EU's thinking in this field. And I think Belarus, um, and in particular, if there was a bit more change in Belarus, it would force the issue more um, to also um, think in, in, in different ways about being part of different um, uh, sort of economic arrangements, um, both uh, more Russia-centered and more, more um, EU-centered. So I think that could become the next, um, next test case there. And I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question about Ukraine and what was the positive correlation. So, oh, I don't know, the maybe. Conflict in Ukraine and annexation of Crimea and the conflict in the past, um, whether, the, uh, whether the economic or cultural interdependence between Ukraine and Russia had a positive correlation on the subsequent conflicts. On the conflict, uh, so you mean the links between Ukraine and Russia have a exactly. positive effect on how the war is actually being fought? That would be quite difficult, I think, yeah, to I show. Think, uh, <laughs> was, uh, okay. Okay, fine. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I leave it to you. <laughs> um, values based geopolitics. Um, often, again, I would be cautious about how that is deployed, in as much as that can be. Uh, um, self-deceptive, a conceit which covers up much more um, kind of traditional attempts to um, create um, states which are going to be absorbed or to push the front line of freedom, to use a Wes Mitchell term or to use a term that is uh, favored by, by neoconservatives. Um, I'm in favor of a value-based geopolitics for us and for our societies. And I think we begin by addressing corruption. We begin by addressing the fact that uh, too often our, our banks, our real estate, uh, and the industries here have been uh, uh, facilitators uh, of uh, corruption uh, in uh, post-Soviet space. Um, and um, I think there's now a realization uh, that this is a, a serious issue. Uh, I think we're, we are interconnected in, in that respect. Um, and um, we, our own particular uh, values for the particular forms of capitalism that we practice, which often doesn't, or which often allows untransparent companies to buy real estate and uh, to buy perhaps media companies and the like, um, that's a serious problem and that's on us and that's on our society and so I would say values-based geopolitics begins at home and begins by having legislation which is much more uh, conscious of those particular issues, much more robust and tough uh, in, in that respect. Uh, the conflicts with uh, Ukraine uh, and Russia, the interdependence issue. I'm, so I'm, my colleagues and I have, have done research in uh, Crimea and public opinion polling there. Uh, and one of the things that, that hasn't come up but it, it, we should talk about is the fact that the term occupied territories is used by both Georgia uh, and Ukraine to refer to contested areas. And we've done polling in these areas, and the people in those areas do not see themselves as occupied. They see themselves as broken from, uh, now this excludes the Donbass, but they see themselves as having, uh, as having uh, broken from the parent state, uh, and uh, in the case of Crimea, being very contented with the uh, 
what we call annexation, what they would call the process that led to the unification of Crimea and Russia. Um, that's the majority sentiment, and I can go into detail on that. It's not true of the Tatar population in Crimea, but it is something that is a fact. It's a social fact, it's a cultural fact, it's an important uh, thing that uh, we need to confront in a clear-eyed way. Uh, in the case of Abkhazia, um, there is a, a, amongst the ethnic Abkhaz, they are the only group within Abkhazia, you know, as, as you know, it's, it's a multi-ethnic society, um, that is in favor of an independent uh, uh, Abkhazia. The rest want to join Russia. In South Ossetia, it's a very small population, overwhelmingly wanted to join Russia. Um, so, as Western powers and uh, uh, as the European Union uh, takes the side of Georgia and takes the particular rhetoric of Georgia, and frankly, I don't think that is very helpful to Georgia uh, uh, and to us in, in terms of understanding what is happening in these, these particular places. Um, it's not helpful in as much as it allows Georgia to define the problem as Russia, that, the pr that there's only one actor, there's only one instrumental force here, when in actuality there's a very complex set of factors which led to the alienation of uh, the Georgian state from the territories that are uh, now so-called so independent states. That, that's something that we need to confront. Uh, it's, it's also true in the case of, uh, uh, of Ukraine. These are places that have um, uh, been radicalized by uh, geopolitical conflict and they have people who have positions that we need to listen to. So in the sense that uh, Gwen has, has also done that research and is, is making the same argument, I think it's very important uh, that we have a more mature conversation about these places and get beyond sort of slogans about them, uh, such as occupied territories. Thank you for that. And I think, you know, both, both um, your responses and the questions are highlighting, you know, in, indeed the kind of the importance of geopolitical storytelling about ourselves and about others, even. Quickly to the three questions. First, for sure, European Union does not have a common security perceptions. It's not only about Russia. Uh, and the story is not that you simply have a Russia-friendly and kind of a, a more Russia-hostile countries. You have a countries in which Russia is not perceived as a security threat at all because they are distant. For example, Spain or Italy. Uh, and this is the biggest problem and this makes European Union such a different actor. But I, I'll go much further than this because this is obvious and we all know it. But I do believe that in our societies in general, with the end of the Cold War, which you break in with is a kind of a type of a security consensus, either on the level of experts or on the level of the population. Look at the United States. In the United States, basically, there is a consensus that the US is in a kind of a new Cold War. The only problem is that the Democrats are in a new Cold War with Russia, while Republicans <coughs> with China. Probably they're going to merge, but this is true. And from this point of view, this is very different than the Cold War, in which they have a common enemy, and you can have a different strategy how you're dealing with this. And I'm saying this because, in my view, this is what we're seeing very much. Foreign policy is coming as more and more important uh, for the domestic publics, but it comes much more as the identity issue than as a classical security issue. And this is where, in my view, is the weakness of uh, geopolitics. You say, where is the values? But in a certain way, the return of geopolitics, in general, means shifts from the policy of value-centered democracy promotion policy, which was typical for the 1990s. This is what basically geopolitics uh, uh, talks about. And it talks about the fact that, first, for some countries, the promotion of democracy was perceived as very much promoting geopolitical interests. Uh, but secondly, basically, I do believe in the West itself, uh, the trust in the democ democracy peace theory is starting to decline. Because in 1990s, the major argument behind democratization was the following. The nature of the regime, is it democracy or not democracy, is very much defining the objectives of foreign policy. Democracy don't fight with each other. Democracy go into a coalition with each other. If you're going to see on some of the major issues, you're going to be surprised how much democracy do not go together. And I'm talking about India, I'm talking Brazil, uh, forget also about... So from this point of view, I do believe that the nature of the regime matters. Uh, 
Uh, but it does not matter in this kind of a simple way that you talk about uh, basically what uh, it defines. And geopolitics said what matters is geography. It matters a kind of a long-term history. So you're going to see different governments which are very different uh, historically and in their political preferences having the same type of a foreign policy. For example, in Bulgaria, you're going to hear it everywhere. The axiom of the Bulgarian foreign policy in the last now almost uh, 90 years is always with Germany, never against Russia. What it means, God knows. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but people are going to basically repeat this all the time. And this is what basically this archetypical type of behavior, which is not based on a concrete situation, it's not based on the nature of the regime, and so on and so on. What I do believe is interesting, and this is where the geopolitics has a problem, is that when identity becomes much more important, ethnic, political, other identities, then this type of an understanding of a territorial state is a stable thing does not work well. Because forget for a moment about Europe and try to tell me how you're going to explain easily what is happening in places like Africa with a classical geopolitical kind of a framework where the basic players are failed states. Could the failed states be a classical actor in the geopolitics or could be only a kind of a victim of the geopolitical interference from outside? So uh, like everything, geopolitical is very vulnerable and I can go to the last story about how, uh, how the interdependence explains and not explains. Normally this is like with the civil wars. The more you are interdependent, naturally believes that it is more difficult for a conflict to break. But when the conflict breaks, it's going to be more disastrous and bloodier, not by accident. The level of violence in certain type of a civil wars are much higher than in a normal kind of a warfare because exactly the interdependence, because exactly of the shared identities and histories, the conflict is becoming much more important for the people taking place. This is one thing to basically go into a quarrel with somebody whom you don't know. It's totally different with your relatives. And from this point of view, this type of a conflict is particularly difficult uh, to resolve. And, uh, and, and I want to make my last point, which is very much about uh, the certain important change in the United States, which I found is less kind of discussed. Because on one level, of course, President Trump has a very aggressive foreign policy. But on the other, you're not going to see him as a war type president. Uh, he liked to talk about war. Obviously, he is not very keen of doing war compared to some of his uh, predecessors. Because for him, the only war which really matters is a trade war. And this is serious war. And basically, he believes it's a zero-sum game. So in order for America should be fine, somebody else should be bad. Uh, but as a result of it, imagine that you're seeing the map of the world very much based on the America trade relations with others. And then you're going to understand one of the basic secrets of his policy. He looks at this map and said, we have such a big trade uh, deficit with Germany. Why we claim that Germany is our ally? And we do not have a trade deficit with Russia. Why do we believe that Russia is an enemy? So from this point of view, if you are basically going with the trade maps, and for me this is very important, it's quite important what kind of a map you're really interested in. And nevertheless, that he's a real estate guide, so from this point of view, he probably knows something about territory, uh, at least the price of it. Uh, but uh, I do believe it's quite important to understand that in this type of a transition period, different type of states, different type of politicians within the same states, they go with the different maps. One leader is going to have the map in which you have the nature of the regime, democracies, not democracies, felt. Other is going to have basically based totally on the trade relations of his country. Third is going to be a security map, basically in which they are soldiers and securities. And all these people believe that they share a world. And this is why from time to time talking to each other, I do believe that they are talking about totally different things. And this is one of the major risks in the world in which we are living in because uh, they have the feeling that they're sharing the same world, but I'm not sure that they do. Thank you for that. So we had a couple of questions out here. Um, Heinz, go ahead. So we have one here right in the very front and then one there and then a few in the back as well. Uh, thank you, Luisa. My name is Heinz Gärtner. I'm with the International Institute for Peace. 
uh, and also I was the University of uh, Vienna. Um, let's assume that uh, NATO enlargement basically uh, was the cause for Russia's action uh, in especially Ukraine, but in uh, Eastern Europe, Georgia, but uh, uh, maybe in other countries as well. So not the trigger, but the cause. So that was a, a ge geopolitical reason. Uh, as we learned during the day uh, by Nikitina, that especially uh, Russia thinks in geopolitical terms as well. So uh, the West is acting geopolitically, Russia is acting geopolitically as well, and we come to the security dilemma, what you described. We have the security dilemma, and it doesn't dissolve. But the way, uh, there's one way you ca could solve the security dilemma. So you say uh, there's no NATO, NATO enlargement for these countries anymore. So no NATO enlargement means non-alignment basically for Ukraine and for other countries as well, based on international law. But otherwise it would be not be uh, credible because Ukraine was neutral constitutionally uh, before and it just uh, withdrew neutrality. But looking at the example of Austria, Austria got, got its uh, territorial sovereignty, territorial integrity and sovereignty back because it became neutral. The Soviets would leave and the other countries would leave as well. But additionally, we had a, a provision, the state treaty. The state treaty would say we would not be allowed to join Germany. So for East Central European states, if they become non-aligned or neutral, whatever, there should be a, a neutrality based on international law, means, meaning not joining, uh, joining NATO, but also to have a, such a provision not joining Russia or parts of it joining Russia. So that is the only way that uh, Ukraine, for example, could get its territorial integrity and sovereignty back. So otherwise, so you have the Austrian model for Ukraine, or you have the German model. So if not, uh, if, if Ukraine would not declare its neutrality, uh, the Russians would stay. Like in Germany, the, the Soviets, uh, which would, would have stayed as, stayed as well for many, uh, for many decades. So may, maybe Ukraine is the most difficult case, uh, but we can look also on Moldova, Belarus, to discuss this uh, solution, because there has to be some solution for the in-between states. Otherwise, there's, there was always in limbo. So my suggestion is to look at this option, uh, if you say not NATO enlargement is the geopolitical cause. Well, alliance, so from this point of view, they're not a neutral country. That, that, that's not permanent, so that's not permanent. So that's... A couple more questions. So there's um, one here and then... The yeah, back. thank you for all the three very thought-provoking and interesting uh, interventions. My name is Veit Bachmann from the University of Bonn. Um, I would like to make maybe a slightly provocative remark and um, I've been wondering where the doubt comes from um, that there is a thing like a, the geopolitical nature of European expansion. Evidently, by any means, by any kind of definition of geopolitics, it is a geopolitical process, a very geopolitical process and when I talk about any kind of definition, uh, definition of geopolitics, even if we talk about the most maybe traditional, classical, standard definition of geopolitics as a great power games, or um, Jared, I use your, your words, geopolitics is about empires. The EU is an empire, certainly in an economic way. Uh, it's the largest integrated economy in the world, or rivaling with the US, depending on which measures you use. Um, but of course, European expansion isn't a geopolitical process. If you want, if you so want, territorial, uh, territorially towards Eastern Europe, but certainly economically for trade regimes in Africa. Um, so even if you use a traditional conception of great power games, of course it's geopolitical. And the second remark I would like to make is that, in my impression, the the conception of geopolitics um, we have been discussing is very narrow, i.e., in that sense of great power games. Um, 
if you think about it in more um, in, in larger ways of uh, a critical geopolitics, also to the question if we still need it as an uh, as a term, if it has done anything, if you don't use the term politically as an academic category, it has opened. Uh, a, a way of looking at things that looks exactly at different kind of complexities that we maybe cannot grasp if we just look at the big powerful actors. Uh, the European Union is an ambiguous empire. DG trade has different interests than DG development. And it's the failed states in Africa is not they are not coherent actors. There are a lot of different interest groups. And and I think geopolitics as an academic discipline has shown a way to capture these kind of complexities uh, that is a bit more nuanced that just create power games in terms of nation states. Sorry, but I'm very, you know, I'm conscious of the time, so we're going to have to cut it off at the questions because I want to have um, the panelists a chance to answer. Who wants to take that on? Jared, do you want to take on the question of how we can expand our <laughs> understanding of who does geopolitics? What is geopo Some geopolitics? Is everywhere. Some empires are better than other empires, and uh, I know that uh, quite a lot of people who are not in the European Union would like to be in the European Union empire. Um, the, um, the issue with um, NATO expansion, uh, NATO as a cause, I, I don't think NATO was a cause. I, I, I wrote a book uh, called Near Abroad, which came out two years ago, on the two invasions, uh, the invasion of Georgia and the invasion of Ukraine, um, and I make the argument uh, about these invasions as co-created. Uh, so it's not one particular cause, and I don't think NATO expansion per se is the one cause, but it goes into great detail and, uh, on those. Um, your solution, however, about neutrality is something that I think should be debated. Now, earlier today, you said that, uh, and this is kind of standard line that you get, um, well, each state should have its sovereign right to join any military alliance that it wants. Yeah, oh, okay, well, maybe, all right, well, but someone said that. Yeah, and it, you know, I hear that, uh, we hear that a lot. And that is the sort of standard line that you get from the Lithuanian foreign minister uh, and others. That is in the sky, abstract thinking, which doesn't take into consideration geography. It matters where a country is relative to another power. That's the value of geography, if, uh, and that uh, is something that is a fact of life. It's ineluctable. Um, and so therefore, it means that certain states do not have the choice um, that other states have. Ireland is a neutral country, uh, and it has good geography relative to Georgia. Georgia is, uh, you know, similarly what they said about Mexico, so close to the United States, so f or so, so far from God, so close to the United States. Um, these are kind of factors of just power geometry, and um, so therefore, given that, w it behooves us as a culture to think about other ways in which we can uh, roll back a zero-sum uh, security dilemma uh, for the in-between countries. And the idea of having a zone of neutrality uh, is, I think, a positive one. There's a last point I want to make, uh, and this is about the term, the narrowness of what we've been saying about geopolitics. There's one thing I haven't talked about, or we haven't talked about, and it's a bit surprising it hasn't come up, and that is climate change. There is a, the fifth understanding of geopolitics is of the Earth. The Earth, which was previously seen as permanent a uh, factor in international affairs, is moving, it's changing. The world in which we live in, the, which sustains life, by the uh, uh, opinions of uh, a lot of respected scientists, it's changing and changing quite dramatically. So what I am concerned about is actually less about the security dilemmas that are with us right now than the security dilemmas that will get created when we have to deal with severe environmental disruption and the kind of causes that's going, the politics that's gonna come along with that. I think there's gonna be a politics around way of life 
and there's going to be a right-wing politics that's very much about protecting that. We saw that in Australia. I think we see that, you know, Bruno Latour makes this argument in his book, Down to Earth. This is what, in part, Trump was about, is that we're not going to adjust in any way to climate change because we want our smartphones, we want that sort of m huge uh, mega structure which gives us the uh, again the comforts that we have right now, but that uses up a norm. Uh, that is a sort of hydrocarbon capitalism which is really changing our world. And if the uh, kind of extreme scenario comes, we're going to be dealing with things very quickly, which have to which are very disruptive. And that's a new type of geopolitics. It's the geopolitics of the of the earth really moving and things not being the same at all as they, as they were. So I apologize, that's a sort of, uh, now for something completely different, but it is a, a factor it's that I mean, it it's very... I mean, it's, I'm, I'm very glad that you know, that Yeah, I think it's that. a very relevant uh, issue for, I think this is how geopolitics will increasingly be understood. There's already people, so my colleague Simon Dalby is writing about this. Uh, there's a, another guy uh, called Clark who, who's writing uh, on it as well as Bruno Latour. Yes, um, briefly on your, your point, I mean, I think I was trying to make a similar one that I think of, I think the EU is deeply geopolitical, but it becomes interesting, and that is sort of, sort of your second point, it's interesting when there's a perceived need to state something about geopolitical, no, that you are or you are not, so that, that's interesting, and that goes back to also that it signifies something that what you highlighted, that then, then it really becomes interesting, and then as a concept, uh, whatever else we, we think about it, it already um, um, has, a, has a clear function there in terms of uh, drawing our attention to something. Um, on the question of neutrality, um, I think it's one of those cases where, um, I mean, at the moment, uh, it's, it's unforeseeable that anybody could give the international guarantees that would be necessary to um, deal with the security concerns in Ukraine or Georgia. That would require, I think, a different Russia than we see it today. But I think it's one of those um, examples where actually the geopolitics from below tell us that story. And if you look at um, uh, that there is a... Um, uh, perceived demand from from below from the population for that third way whatever it might look like so if you actually in surveys ask um, the question most of the time uh, the question is not asked in the in the surveys that political elites in for example Ukraine or Georgia refer to um, do you want to be part of NATO or not or maybe there's a question about um, do you, how would you vote in a referendum but when you do add the question on neither or uh, neither this or, nor that, um, or um, no neutrality, or yet another version of that, um, that is actually, that gains significant support and the trend is rising. So uh, that I think is an interesting one, one, one further example of sort of looking at this geopolitics from below. While there is no institutional arrangement that could currently um, take care of it, there is um, a significant and, and growing kind of perception that that is what countries might need in the region. Ivan, I'll let you have the closing words. Very brief. Uh, because the paradox with Ukraine is that why to become a neutral when they were? Not based on international law. Okay, uh, but you, know, so you have the Budapest, you have the Budapest Agreement in which basically, no, 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 but Budapest Agreement was based on the fact that the three big players are going to guarantee the security based on the fact that they decided to go with a nuclear disarmament. Uh, so from this point of view, there was an international treaty that was going to make it impossible. But why I'm saying this, uh, it's, uh, it's not on a normative level that I disagree. I do believe that it's much more difficult to define and sustain neutrality in a highly interdependent world where economic connections and others are as important as security presence. If basically neutrality means simply that you're not going to allow the f army of uh, other countries to enter, this you can be deal with. And I agree very much, not only now, even before the Bucharest summit, there was not a majority of the Ukrainians that have been pushing for entering NATO. So from this point of view, the public was there. The problem is that, and this is the problem of neutrality, is very difficult to come when you're going to decide on issues like sanctions or what you're doing with 5G and so on, which are not kind of a classical military presence issues. And then you're not in the middle. Uh, and then both sides have a very strong strategic interest to push you to take their side.
Uh, and I do believe from this point of view, neutrality is much more difficult to be negotiated to make sense, because otherwise, symbolically, you can do it. And I don't see this as a major issue. Of course, sovereignty and so on goes, but of course, Ukraine has a sovereign right to ask to join NATO, and NATO has a joint sovereign right not to allow them to join. This is not the issue for me, but the issue is what it really means in a highly contested areas in which it's not about military presence, and I'm talking about the case in which you don't have a occupied territory, so things like this, even if this is going to be divided. And this is the last point about Ukraine, because the interesting story is that this interdependence is becoming particularly vulnerable when it, gets, when it affects democratic countries. And this is one of the things that we learned very uh, recently, is that democracies are particularly vulnerable to interference from outside because of the competitive nature of their regimes. So let's give you the way probably I wrongly read uh, the interests of the Russia and Ukraine when it comes also to Donbass and others. On one side, Russia basically wants to keep a control of Donbass, but they're very much interested also Donbass to go back uh, to the Ukrainian electoral body because they're not against people living in Donbass to vote on the Ukrainian elections, which is going to make basically Russia much stronger present in uh, Kiev. On the other side, Kiev symbolically, of course, very much wants to have the territory back, but they're not very eager to see these people voting on their elections. Uh, so from this point of view, electoral maps uh, and other maps does not go easily together. And I do believe this is a kind of a new issue when we talk about geopol geopolitics, and I agree with you, is how it works when you have a political regimes which are also, from time to time, spatially divided because of the voting. Uh, and for example, we have been talking a lot about interference because of the social media and others who Russians would do. Turkish president goes and tells you the Germans from Turkish origin how to vote. Is this an interference in the politics? How it goes with the law? And this is going to be more and more common because, strangely enough, the vulnerability of the democratic regimes comes from the fact that divisions are perceived as legitimate. It's legitimate. You cannot tell people not to do it if you want to keep their rights. So from this point of view, I uh, understand basically where the, uh, the idea of neutrality comes as a kind of a symbolic uh, uh, solution. I cannot see how this is going to act on the ground in order to make a meaning for both sides. I mean, not for the Ukrainians, but I mean both sides from outside of Ukraine. Thank you very much for that. I don't know if we've answered the question whether geopolitics has returned or not, but hopefully we have raised actually more questions and made you think maybe a bit more critically about how the term is used, wielded by politicians and not only. So we hope you can continue the discussion at least for a bit uh, downstairs with some wine and cheese. So we will invite you all downstairs, but first let me thank the panelists for what was a very interesting discussion. Thank you.